Hello and welcome back to the Start a Glamping Business podcast. Today we've got Zach Stoltenberg as a guest. He is a outdoor hospitality studio director. He runs Clockwork Architecture and Design and they are an architecture firm that specialise in glamping and all sorts of hospitality resorts. I've spoken to numerous people within the industry and they all say that Zach is the best in the business and we work close with him on client projects when it comes to getting all the permits and site designs that you need for your glamping project. Project. So, Zach, I'll hand the floor over to you. Why don't you just introduce yourself, your backstory, how you got into the architecture industry, and how you came to specialize in the glamping or, and hospitality industry? Sure. So, as you said, I'm a licensed architect in the United States. Um, uh, my firm, Clockwork, we have about 12 architects. We're based in Kansas City. So, I, I head up most of our outdoor hospitality, resort design. So, glamping, camping, RV resorts. And I've been with the company for two years. I was at a, a previous firm before that, as some of these opportunities for, for outdoor hospitality were being presented, they said, This is not what we do. We're a, we're a healthcare firm, we're an office firm. We don't get this. And, and so, we parted ways. And Christian Arnold, the, the director of the Clockwork, the owner of Clockwork, um, he and I had several conversations over about a year and he said, you know, why don't you come and join us and, and we'll support you. If you want to pursue this and try to build this and grow this, we're, we're here every step of the way. And so I joined Clockwork in 2000, I believe. So I've been there about two years and it, it's been a really wonderful move for me. Um. Uh, I, I had previously done two or three small resorts before and, and really with the support of, of a new firm that, that shared the vision and saw the opportunity in, in outdoor hospitality. I think currently we have over 40 active projects. Some of those are in construction. Some of those are in construction documents and, and preparing for bids and estimates. Some of those are still very early at a schematic level, but we, we do work all over the country. The firm, I believe we have 27 states that we are licensed in. And I'm a, a certificate holder as an architect, which is just a fancy title that means it's very easy for me to get licensed in, in any state that I'm not currently licensed in. I've been an architect for, for 15 years. I graduated from the University of Kansas and have my master's degree in architecture. And it's, it's something I think I've always kind of known. I, I just decided probably seventh or eighth grade that, that I wanted to be an architect. And, and I think that's unusual in the industry. Um, or in, in most industries, but not in architecture. Most of my colleagues, most people that I talk to say, well, when did you decide to be an architect? And most of them were before high school even. So I, I think it's, you know, like a lot of other industries, it, it's a calling. It's something you're drawn to. You know, I, I used to get in trouble in school because I would be doodling plans and, and doing drawings instead of math or English or whatever subject I was supposed to be doing. Uh, cause I wasn't interested in that. I knew what I was interested in. So yeah, it's, it's something I think I've always kind of known was, was my calling, um, on how I got into glamping and camping. I think it's, it's like anything else. And, and most architects will tell you this, you know, no one sets out to specialize in something you, you do one and you kind of learn as you're going, you, you do two and you get pretty good at it. By the time you've done your third one, you, you got it figured out. You're kind of an expert, but I, I think really the key to to our success and our rapid growth over the last two years has been in how we treat our clients and how we we run our business and what our core values are um you know we we focus very heavily on people i've always said you know i don't i don't design buildings i don't design resorts i create spaces for people um and and we take our client approaches very much the same way we we really don't advertise you know if you do a google search you're not going to find Clockwork as an outdoor hospitality expert, you know, we're, we're not doing that. Most of our, our growth is referral and it's, it's through people that we've worked with that have said, Hey, we use these guys. We worked with these guys. They're incredibly talented. They're wonderful. We love that. Can't recommend them highly enough. And, you know, every job that we do, that's, that's a stepping stone in, in our growth, but it's really kind of happened organically. I started my first, my first project in outdoor hospitality was an RV resort and it was local to me. And it was, there was a public meeting, public hearing on part of their planning and zoning. And it, it went awful. I mean, it was really, really terrible. And uh, there were, was a lot of opposition. Neighbors were ready to, you know, run them out of town on a rail. And I came up to them after the meeting and I said, you know, I want you guys to know that 
not everybody here is opposed to this. I think this is an incredible idea. I can, can see the potential in it. It would be a great thing in this area. We need something like this. And I don't want you guys to get discouraged. And we started a conversation that night and about two months later, they hired me and said, help us, you know, get through this process because as an architect, I was very familiar with that. I'd never done RV before, but I, I knew development. I knew planning and zoning. I've, I've served as a, a planning commissioner on, on the, the council for my local town where we live. And, and so I said, you know, I know the process. You can teach me what I need to know about the RV. And I, I actually worked with a very, very talented uh, RV resort designer out of the Pacific Northwest. And, you know, he kind of took me under his wing and, and shared some of the basics and, and helped me understand what's really important about laying out RV spots and sites. And, and I learned a lot. And we went back in for a planning commission hearing about three months after the disastrous first um the difference is when we went in the second time we'd done community outreach meetings to talk to the people in the town and talk to the neighbors we had full 3d plans and renderings to show them what it was going to look like we talked about how it was going to operate and run and this time there was was standing room only again in the meeting but most of the people that were there were there to support us and and not shoot us down and we got unanimous on that that reapply and that client was wonderful to work with and they were very well connected in the rv world the rv space and they had shared our plans with a lot of different people and that's when i started getting phone calls hey you know we saw what you did on this project we need something similar we're at the same stage we need help and so it started as one and then two and then and and glamping really has been for us, about the last 18 months, 12 to 18 months, that we've probably seen a larger shift into glamping resorts. And and over half of what we do now is glamping. And we still do, do quite a bit of RV as well. Um, and, you know, they're different industries, but there's a lot of overlap. And, and a lot of RV resort designers are waking up and, and have realized, I think it was two years ago at, at Arvik, which is the, the RV campground owners association meeting. And I don't remember who it was. One of the speakers on stage got up and said, you know, resort owners, if you are not looking at glamping, you are on your way to going out of business, that this industry is growing. It's not going away. And you should be focusing on how you can possibly add some glamping units in your RV resorts. So we do have a lot of overlap. This, this site visit I'm out on today um, has RV, has glamping, it has a marina. So there's, there's boats and jet skis, you know, it's very diverse. We're looking at tree houses and cabins. So I, I think that's sort of the exciting part of outdoor hospitality is there's, there's so many different avenues and different things that we can do. Yeah. Ironically enough, I literally wrote a blog yesterday on why RV site owners and campground owners need to add glamp into their offering. So that's great timing. I'll put the link in the, in the description. I can also vouch for you being hard to find on Google as well, because I've tried before and it's an absolute nightmare. So it's a good <laughs> job. You've got good word of mouth referrals. Um, so today what we're going to focus on, and you gave a, a, a little taste there of, of sort of top tips for acquiring permits, because you said you did community outreach and you really took the time before you actually stood in front of the committee. Um, and we're going to get onto that later, but what, what I want to discuss today is the specifics of permit acquisition for glamping projects. So as we'll get into pretty much every glamping project, will need some kind of permit to, to, to be legally built and developed and operate. And so we're going to, we're going to get into that, but first, just so everyone is aware, could you just introduce to us the concept of like a, a permit for glamping and, and what and how broad that term can be and then maybe dig into the specifics of spe you know special use or conditional use permits sure so I, really before we get to any permits everything starts at at the zoning level so wherever your property is wherever you're thinking about building your resort you're, you're going to fall under some jurisdiction now that that may be a city or town that could be a county if it's a rural property um there are a few states where even the county doesn't do any regulatory uh, uh, authority that it, everything is done at the state level. And those are some of the more low population states, Wyoming, for example. We've, we've run into a site there where the, the local county said, we have, we have nothing, it's all handled at the state. So I think step one is, is usually identifying who is your jurisdiction, who has authority over what you're allowed to do or not do on your property. And then looking at what is your current zoning? You know. 
typically uh, he's going to fall into kind of one of three main categories. The first being residential, which, you know, is self-explanatory. It's, it's homes, neighborhoods. The second would be commercial. So those are retail shopping areas, things like that. And then the third would be industrial. So factories, warehouses, manufacturing facilities, those, those types of functions. Now glamping doesn't really fall into any one of those three categories. Um, and so there, there's a couple of different ways to look at it, but the, the first step is figuring out what is my existing zoning and, and then what is allowed in that zoning. So, you know, glamping, essentially it's, it's very similar to residential, right? It's, it's a similar function, similar use. And so glamping may, may very well be allowed in a residential area with the rise of Airbnb and sort of online nightly rentals. A lot of jurisdictions are, are starting to regulate that a little bit more. And, and one of the, the spinoffs of that is that glamping is kind of treated similar to that, right? It's a room for rent for the night. And it's, and so in some jurisdictions, they look at it and, and classify it as commercial it would be treated just like a hotel, which isn't always a good thing because that brings with it additional building code requirements, additional development requirements, additional studies on your site. It, it's a much more involved process to, to go to a commercial project. And so there, there's an in-between piece where it, it's not necessarily a buy right use under residential, whereas under commercial, you, you'd be allowed to do glamping, no problem. And that's where you get into what you mentioned earlier, a, a conditional use permit or a special use permit. So that's a process that allows functions that normally would not be a buy right use. It, Maybe I should explain that term a little bit too. Mm. So a use that is by right is a use that under your existing zoning, you don't need any additional permission to do. So if I'm zoned residential and I want to build a single family home, I don't have to go through planning and zoning to get approval to do that. That's an allowable use by right under my current zoning. And so the, the special use permit or conditional use permit is a way to say, you know what, this isn't technically residential but we don't see a conflict with it occurring in a residential area. So examples of this might be uh, someone that has an in-home daycare center or a small business that they operate out of their garage or their basement. Those are, are not necessarily by right uses in a residential area, but it, it doesn't really have a negative impact on the area. It doesn't have a negative impact on property values. It, it's something that, you know, people can, can do. And so, there's a, a process with most jurisdictions where you're still going to go before a planning and zoning committee. You're going to say, this is what we want to do. This is what it's going to look like. This is how it's going to operate. And then they approve a special use permit or a conditional use permit that allows you to do that thing in the area that you're zoned currently. And, and what that is or what those requirements are is going to be different in every jurisdiction. So step two would be to reach out to your local official. You know, most of them are very knowledgeable. They're very easy to talk to. When we start a project, one of my first steps always is to contact the local jurisdiction, the building officials, the planning and zoning director, the community development director, whoever that is that, that oversees that process and set up a meeting with them. And, and a lot of times we try to do those in person, especially if we're going out to visit the site, we try to meet with the city officials as well. And so, that, that would be a second step is, is to meet with your official and say, this is what we'd like to do. This is the property we're at. What does this look like? What is, what is the process going to look like? What do we need to do for that? And, and they'll usually give you kind of a roadmap for where you need to go. Now, the, the third piece, and, and maybe this goes between one and two, or maybe goes after, after I would say is, is to seek out a professional. You know, I, I won't say that you can't do this on your own. There's, there's plenty of glamping resorts, beautiful glamping resorts all around this country that are, are run by, you know, a husband, wife, or, or a couple that did it all on their own. And you, you absolutely can. A lot of times though, that takes a, a much longer time period, much longer process to go about doing that. I'm actually working with some clients in Georgia right now. We've been on their projects since about February or March this year, we took it over and they had been trying to do it on their own for two years previous to that. And so we've been able to get them to a permit in six months after they've waited for, for two years since they started trying to, to navigate this process with their county. So step three, I would say is, is seek out professionals, people that know the industry, people that can help you navigate that process. And because getting through your permits, that's just step one. After, after that, there's, there's the, the real hard work. That's when it, it begins. 
A couple of other things under permits that I would add, depending on your site, sometimes there are environmental impacts that have to be looked at. You may need environmental studies, looking at utilities on your site. Not all sites have available utilities. So whether you have a, a connection for sewer or whether you're looking at doing a septic on the site, are you allowed to do that? What is the process for that? A lot of times before they will, will consider something, even at the planning and zoning level, they want to make sure that some of those other things are in place. And so you, you may have to get, uh, you know, additional permits for utilities or land disturbance, or if you have wetlands or protected areas on your property and, and some of that, again, meeting with your local jurisdiction, they can, they can give you kind of a heads up on, Hey, I think some of these might be issues for you or, or things you want to check into. Okay, so let's focus in on the conditional or special use permit. Uh, what's the, what's the roadmap for that generally? Obviously it you know, varies from county to county and state to state, but what would be a typical process for acquiring a, a special use permit for a glamping project? So typically they're going to want a site, which is, is part of what we do. And, and that's, you know, showing a, a map essentially of where the, the lot or where the property is and then what you want to do with it. So where are your buildings, where are your roads? And they're going to review that based on a couple of, of different, you know, parameters, code, code related and otherwise. Um, but a, a site plan for sure, probably some example renderings or, or images of what your buildings and what your structures might look like. And, and that can be very prescriptive. So it, again, it depends on the jurisdiction. Some jurisdictions want to see the actual drawing of the actual building that you're going to, to build. Others might accept something that's a, a character image, right? Like, well, we don't know exactly the glamping tent that we're going to use, but it might look something like these. And you can use example images of uh, existing resorts or, or images from, you know, whatever dealer or manufacturer you're buying your units from. So you, you give some examples of, of what type of improvements you want to do. And then there's usually a, a long list of requirements. And so we will typically put together a narrative that kind of talks through some of those issues. So. The, the biggest thing with a conditional use or a special use permit is that you have to demonstrate that what you are planning to do, your, your glamp ground is not going to have a negative effect on surrounding property owners. It's not going to have a negative effect on property values. It, it's not going to put a, a tax or a demand on city services or utilities. There's, there's several different legal thresholds that you're, you're trying to demonstrate that you're meeting through that. Now, again, every state, every jurisdiction is different in, in Kansas, where I live, we have established case law dealing with that. It, it's referred to as the seven golden rules. And it, it comes out of a, a, a state Supreme court case. That was, that was the last name of, of, uh, the filee, their, their name was golden. So it was the golden case and it established seven rules by which planning and zoning committees have to evaluate a project. And so they're looking at those seven principles and saying, does this meet those standards? Now, other states have different standards. Other, other jurisdictions may have, have different thresholds, but essentially what that process is, is looking at what it, what are those standards? And then how can we demonstrate that we're meeting those standards? And then the, the end of that process is typically your hearings. So you're, you're going to go before your planning and zoning committee, those are usually appointed positions, not elected officials. Um, and so they're, they're usually it's a mix. Sometimes they're, they're lay people. Sometimes they're professional people. There might be architects or engineers on that committee to, to kind of, you know, weigh in, give their experience, their expertise and advice. Sometimes it's, you know, local business owners and uh, people that are, are just in, involved or, or concerned about the area. And, and usually those hearings are open to the public. And so part of that process also involves notification of neighbors of, of surrounding property owners, because, Hey, I'm planning to do something on this property. It may have an impact on this area. And so you're required by law to, to notify those surrounding property owners that, Hey, there's, there's a planned action. And, and that's what I alluded to earlier. Nothing can trip you up or, or create a heartache and hardship in that process like a neighbor getting a letter in the mail and saying, I have no idea what this is. And, and, you know, showing up to a, a public meeting, thinking the worst, assuming the worst, 
and and kind of anticipating that this is going to be a fight or I don't understand it. I don't know what this is. So I want to stop it. And so usually even before that, if we think that that might be an issue, we try to reach out to all of those neighbors. And again, when you're working with planning and zoning, they will typically pull up a map. They'll give you a list of names and addresses, sometimes phone numbers for all of those property owners that are around you so that you can reach out and, and talk to them and say, hey, you know, we're your neighbors. We wanted to share with you what we're doing. And so a lot of times we will also do what we call community engagement meetings. We've done those digital, we've done them on Zoom or, or Google Meets. We've done those in person where you know, we'll rent out a facility and we'll bring in food and drinks and we'll have a big you know, PowerPoint presentation up on a projector um, to share with everyone what we're doing. It also gives them an opportunity to ask questions. So if there, if there are things that they're concerned about or we know might be an issue for them, we make sure that we listen. And, and that if there's something that we can do to eliminate those concerns in the design that, that we address it, um, a couple of examples, you know, neighbors worried about guests trespassing, right there. How do they know when they're leaving your property? I don't want people showing up in my backyard. So we've, we've done fencing, we've done barriers, we've done signage that says, you know, Hey, this is, you're, you're leaving the glide grant. You need to you know, go back where you came from. So sometimes it's very simple and, and things that we can easily do to accommodate some of those neighbor concerns. Other times it's through policy. You know, I've had neighbors concerned about, well, are you going to allow animals? Are we going to have dogs running free? And, we just, you know, we'll clarify that for you right now. Here's our rules and we do not allow. And so sometimes it's, it's handled more in that narrative or in our policy or our, our operations, our rules rather than through something that's a design element. Because if you don't do that ahead of time, those are all the things that are gonna come up when you have your public meeting. And all those people are gonna be there with those same questions. So anything that you can do ahead of time to build some, some rapport and some goodwill with those neighbors. And I mean, it's, it's the right thing to do. You know, they're, they're gonna live there even after you're open, you don't want problems with those, those folks. And so reaching out early on in the process, letting them feel like they're involved and informed is, is usually a much better approach and, and way to go. And how much of an effect would you say that neighbors typically have on the actual decision-making process? Because obviously technically they're not on the planning board or committee and yet they, cl they clearly do have an effect. So, so how much of an effect does it have? And, and does that vary from, from jurisdiction to jurisdiction? Yeah, absolutely. It does. You know, it, anytime that you're in a more sensitive area, a couple of examples that I would give, we have a, a project right now that's on a lake. It's a heavily populated lake. It's a very heavily regulated lake. What we've proposed is, is absolutely allowable. We, we can do it. All the, the jurisdiction officials, the Corps of Engineers that controls the lake, the local county officials, everyone is supportive. Everyone has been on board. Um, and we have a very small, but very vocal group of of neighbors that just don't understand what it is and haven't bothered really to learn what it is. And so the rumor mill has started, you know, immediately and, and, and some of it is really crazy stuff, you know, rumors of this is, this is some Chinese investor that's just trying to come in and, and buy up the lake really, really far-fetched. And, and so, you know, it, it can get out of hand very quickly, but as far as, you know, what impact it can have, I, I like to have a little bit of faith in the system just because it's it's part of what we do it's part of the you know what we work within and and i've seen it work uh, more often times than it doesn't and so i think you know usually a, a planning and zoning committee they're going to make their decision based on the laws and and based on the regulations not on public opinion and and really they can't they can't even evaluate their own personal opinion in in most cases yeah I, I mentioned that i served as a planning commissioner for my town there were a lot of proposals that came up that i personally didn't like and i still voted to approve it because they met the legal threshold that was there it's like a jury in a court yeah yeah absolutely you know they're they're there to guide the process and you know we're we're in america so there is a process that's there and, and everybody has a voice and can be heard, but that doesn't mean that, you know, you get to make a decision for what someone else does on their property. But I, I think the biggest area where that comes into is that, that evaluation of a negative impact to surrounding property owners. If all those neighbors feel like they are being 
harmed in some way by what you're proposing to do and you haven't demonstrated that they're not or that you you know haven't taken their concerns into account um then then that could be a rationale or reason to deny your project and say you know you, you've ignored all of these concerns you haven't addressed this so we don't know if there's a negative impact or not but it could be perceived that there is and that could be grounds to to deny your project fortunately I've, I've had a pretty good track record with those and the approach that we generally try to take, you know, by reaching out to neighbors and talking to people ahead of time and, and making sure that, you know, really clear information is out there. More often than not, by the time we get to that public meeting, it is more of a rubber stamp because we've already done the legwork with staff, with planning, with the commissioners, you know, so that everybody's kind of on the same page going into that. And, and we've done the the legwork and, and outreach to the neighbors too. So they're on board. So clearly neighbors can be an issue when, when they rally against something, but would you say that they are generally the biggest hurdle when it comes to acquiring a special use permit, or is there another common factor that is generally a bigger roadblock when it comes to permit acquisition? I would say probably the bigger issues that typically come up are, are things that deal with health and life safety. So can we get a fire truck in and out of the site? Can an ambulance get to the site? Can we get public utilities? How are you going to get your water? What are you doing with your, your sewage? Because all of those issues are, are very tightly regulated and some sites, just the site itself presents a challenge. You know, the nature of doing a glamping resort, everyone that wants to do a glamping resort wants to do it on a property that looks like this with, with a beautiful lake. They don't want to do this, you know, in town or, or next to a, a shopping center or development that has all the utilities and everything and, and development would be really easy there. They, the, the site itself is the reason to go there. And some of those sites present the biggest challenges for development because your, your nearest water line, you know, if you're in a rural area, your nearest water line might be six or eight miles. Um, so then what do you do? Well, can we get a well? If we can get a well, how much is that going to cost? Can we get a permit for that? You know, is, is it feasible in this area? You know, I've, I have several sites in Arizona that we're working on right now. And in Arizona, water is everything. Water is life. And a lot of the state is a desert. And so water is, is always an issue. And we've adjusted designs on those. You know, we're not doing Olympic-sized swimming pools in those resorts because they don't have the water for it. And, and even, even if we had the water, a lot of people out there would look at that and say, that's kind of an egregious use, right? That's, that's an abuse. We, we can't believe in an area that, you know, has such a, a shortage of water. And I think they're in like year 12 of a drought right now and all the lakes are low, you know, somebody even coming in and presenting that it, it appears as though you're just out of touch. You know, you're, you're insensitive to the importance of that issue in that part of the country. So a lot of times those things end up being bigger hurdles just because of the process. You know, it might take six months to a year to get permits to do some of, some of that type of work. Um, another big hurdle, big challenge is the environmental side. You know, we have a, a beautiful property in Maryland that we finished up schematic design on a few months ago. It looks out onto the Chesapeake Bay. It's absolutely breathtakingly gorgeous, but about a third of the site is a wetland and we can't touch it. We can't, can't do anything with it. There can be no redevelopment of it. Um, they don't even allow mitigation of it. So it's just, it's a challenge. You know, when we went in at the beginning, we knew what that hurdle was. We knew that that was going to be an issue. And so we adjusted our design to, to account for it and try to hit a profitable number of units without using that part of, of the property. And what's some general advice outside of neighborly outreach that you would recommend for anyone looking to acquire a permit that can be commonly applied regardless of the jurisdiction? You know, honestly, I, I think the best general advice would be just education, you know, equip yourself, be, be your own expert and your own advocate that when people ask you questions, you know, know the answer, or if you don't know the answer, know where you need to go to look to find that answer and then follow up with that person. You know, I, I think when you go into a, a planning and zoning hearing or you, you're applying for those permits and they're asking those questions, being prepared and being ready and, and having the answers really helps you improve your, your chances. You know, when, when they've asked you the, the fourth question in a row and you say, well, I don't know, that it's not going to bode well for your, your chances of getting an approval. So yeah, just 
really being an expert and knowing everything about your resort and what you want to do. And if you're not having those people there with you so that, that they can, can speak on your behalf. Okay. Now we've been speaking for, I don't know, half an hour, 40 minutes now. And even though you have 100% provided a lot of really, really valuable content, we have been talking about legislation and permits and quite frankly, the boring stuff. Yeah, exactly. I didn't <laughs> want to say it because it's our livelihoods, but it's true. It's probably boring. So now we get it for the listeners to, to add a bit of more of an interest towards the end of the episode. I want to talk about something more fun, which is you've obviously worked on a lot of, of glamping resorts and also all kinds of hospitality resorts. And I'm sure you've seen some really cool features or ideas on those, on those plans. So I want to hear you talk about the coolest or the best or the best the one that makes the most business sense, like some kind of feature or idea that you've seen that was really cool and stands out and that our listeners might be interested in, even if it's just knowing about or even applying to their own project. Well, I would say, I think I'm going to answer the question a little bit different. So, you know, when we start a design for, for a site, absolutely everything that we do from, from day one, clear through the finish end is driven by guest experience. You know, one of the things that makes glamping and outdoor hospitality unique is that it's not just an accommodation, right? If somebody just wants a room for the night, they could stay at a, a Marriott or a Hilton a lot cheaper than they're going to stay at any glamping resort. And so why do people make the decision that they want to come and they're looking for a different experience and, and that guest experience is, is integral. It's, it's, you know should be at the core of every decision, every design that you do and, and thinking about what is that like? And, and then how does that influence your design? So a couple of examples that I would give, you know, we have some properties that are in historic areas and the, the area has a lot of history. We, we've worked with a client, it's a beautiful property, just a couple miles from the Gettysburg battles, battlefield in Pennsylvania. And when we looked at, at that site, I mean, it would have been preposterous for us to go in and, and design some uber modern edgy type resort, right? That that's not what's in that area. And so I would say, you know, some of the best designs I think are things that are drawn from the site itself or from the area itself. And, and so on that one, you know, obviously heavy civil war influence. We borrowed largely from the, the local vernacular architecture for the area. Uh, the glamping tents that we're doing there will be kind of styled and themed like the, the old Civil War, you know, little rectangular canvas tents. Because people that are coming to that area are coming there for that. They're, they're coming to visit the battlefield. They want to see the history. They want to do that. And so trying to craft that guest experience for something that's really appropriate to that site it has been really uh, unique and interesting. We have a, a property that's on the Oregon Trail and, you know, we immediately said, well, we have to do wagons here. I mean, I, I called Jason from, from Conestoga Wagon Company, the best manufacturer in, in the entire country. I think Jason's got over 500 wagons out there right now, you know, knows his stuff is, is building the best units. And I said, you know, what, what could we do? And, and having really good relationships with a lot of these vendors and these manufacturers, you know, a lot of times we get to do some custom things, you know, could we do this? Could we do that? You know, he and I were talking, I think he's, he's got a new product coming out. That's a beer wagon. So all the coolers and everything are on board. And he said, you can tow that around your resort and, and serve drinks every night. Or if you want to set that up by your pool and do that. And it, it you know, it's something that would totally fit on this site. And, and again, people that are coming to that area they're they're there for that they're there to see some of those sites to visit a national monument that's there um they're learning their kids are there they're learning about that hey how cool would it be if, if we could spend the night in a wagon on the oregon trail right so some of those are the things that i get really excited and, and charged up about i've got a, a property out in arizona that we're doing a, a brand new type of unit a stargazer unit on it the the structure itself is going to be 3d printed out of concrete and then it has a, a full glass dome that goes over the top. But again, that site, it, it's in the middle of the desert. It's in a dark skies area. It's almost 30 miles from any surrounding towns or, or lights. And you can literally stand on that site and see the Milky Way band right running up through the sky. And so, you know, we knew we wanted to take advantage of that in a really special and unique way. And so developing a new glamping unit that puts a bed up under a glass dome that you're staring at the stars 
and the the dark skies you know all through the the resort all the lighting everything is is directed down to the ground and and taking advantage of that those are the things that i get the the most excited about also anything that's a specific site feature we have a, a resort in georgia right now that's on lookout mountain in georgia and the site sits literally perched on the edge of the mountain and so we have glamping units that, that hang out over the edge. The deck hangs over the edge. And we did some fun design things, right? We we put cargo nets in into the decking so people can literally, you know, hang out, chill with with some pillows and blankets in the cargo net, and you're you're suspended out over the edge of the mountain. Um, we have some really interesting and and massive rock outcroppings on that property, and there were there were two rocks, one kind of leaned in and the other was a little bit shorter kind of leaned the other way and we've designed a patio space in between there and we're going to up light all the the rocks we've got a projector set up where they can show movies projected on the side of the rock the gray granite reflects really well so you know things that are site specific and and that's really one of the things that's most fun to me that's why we always try to do a site visit early on in the process is to look at what can we draw from the site? Are there design cues that are here? How can we take advantage of some of the best features here? How can we work with nature? You know, most glamping resorts, we're not bringing bulldozers in and clearing all the trees. We want, we want to keep that, that look and feel there. Right. And, and that's hopefully provided a little bit of a reward for all the listeners who have stuck all the way through the permitting chat and <laughs> that's got their creative juices flowing. So that's great. Thank you. Now it back to the, to the, the boring stuff. If someone wants to get in touch with you to discuss their permit application or glamping site design or anything in that content, how can they go about doing that? You can reach us on our, our website. It's hard to find. <laughs> I know. I know you just type in the direct URL. It's, it's clockwork dash ad.com. They can email me. My, my email address is Zach at clockwork dash ad.com. And I'm, I'm on LinkedIn and, and all the, you know, the, the, the gram and all that. We do actually have a, a very active Instagram page for, for our company and, and some of the stuff that we do. So we look up clockwork on Instagram as well. And, you know, I would say again, I think part of the, the strength that we have is some of our, our partnerships. Um, you know, we, we work with a lot of different individuals, both in the RV industry and the glamping industry. We are members of the American Glamping Association, and we will be at the glamping show in Colorado here. What, what are we now about five weeks, six weeks out? Yeah. I need to book my yeah. flight. <laughs> yeah. We will have a booth at the glamping show. And, and so if, if they're planning on going, we'd love to chat with them and, and, you know, book some time that we could follow up and, and learn a little bit more. I know we're always so pressed at those shows. It, it's sort of a, you know, you, you meet a thousand people over two days and, and then you get an email a week later and you're like, I have no idea who this person <laughs> is. <laughs> I know the pain. So, um, yeah, I think we're going to take a little different approach this year. And I'm actually just going to, going to start scheduling the meetings while we're there. So anybody that wants to to chat or follow up with us. We're going to set the meeting. I I'll have it right there on the schedule. We'll send it out as soon as we get home. And, and that way we make sure we can, can give everybody more than the, the 20 minutes of attention as, as they're walking through the, the, um, the, the vendor hall, the trade booths and all that, but yeah, those are easy. And anyone who knows me knows, you know, I, I travel a lot out of the office a lot. And, and so a lot of times, you know, I, I'm the kind of guy that I'd, I'd rather pick up the phone and just talk to someone than go back and forth with 40 emails, you know, that, that take a week to, to get everything through when we could do it in a 20 minute phone conversation. So. Cool. Okay. Well, thank you for your time, Zach. And thank you for giving your expertise as well as that, that creative inspiration at the end. So yeah, the, the links to, to all your stuff will be in the description and yeah. Thank you again for coming on. Absolutely. Thank you for having me.